Hello, welcome to the Science for Policy podcast. My name, as always, is Toby, and today I'm here with Florian Zusengut. Uh, Florian is the head of office for the Innovation Dialogue, which is a scientific advisory body created by Angela Merkel to act as a platform for conversation among the federal government in Germany, business and science. Florian works at the German National Academy of Science and Engineering, which calls itself ACATEC. He was trained in sociology and was formerly a research fellow at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. So, Florian, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Nice to be here. Thank you. Hi. I gave a very vague top line description of what the innovation dialogue is, but perhaps we could get going um, if you could say a bit more about that. Who exactly is involved in this dialogue and what do you talk about? So the Innovation Dialogue is an advisory board to the uh, Chancellor in Germany, so Angela Merkel, on topics of innovation policy. So basically, uh, the Chancellor, the head of the Chancellery, the Ministers of Education uh, and Research, uh, Economy and Finance meet twice a year to discuss uh, innovation policy with a circle of experts, the so-called Steering Committee. And I'm heading the office that's preparing these uh, sessions and uh, the topics for these sessions. Great, thank you. And when you say innovation, what exactly does that mean? So basically, we use the OECD definition of innovation. So it's about doing things. It's not just the act of invention, but putting it into practice. So uh, new business models, new technologies, uh, scaling up um, new production uh, capabilities and things like that. So basically, we're not interested in basic science per se, but then the step transforming basic science into uh, value creation. Right, so very practical advice then, like translating science into value for society. Yeah, we try to. So the the goal is to uh, secure and expand value creation within Germany and, of course, to secure uh, the quality of life uh, within Germany. So that are our main goals when we uh, try to give uh, advice. All right, so you say it's not about basic science, but your office is based at Akatech, which is a science academy. So what's the role of the academy in all this? So we are a facilitator, so we prepare these sessions. Um, maybe it has to be mentioned that Akatech has a special structure when it comes to an academy of science. So on one hand, we have the classical uh, academy structure, so with uh, distinguished uh, researchers within Germany and some abroad um, constituting the membership of the academy. But on the other side, we have the so-called Senate, uh, consisting of companies active within Germany, uh, which are strong in innovation, uh, research and engineering sciences. And we try to bring those two sides together because, of course, quite a lot of research and innovation Uh, when it comes to engineering and applied sciences, not just happens within uh, research laboratories and universities, but within uh, the labs of companies too. So we try to draw from both sides. And of course, this pays off when it comes to preparing the innovation dialogue, because of course, with many uh, topics of innovation, it's not enough to just have uh, scientists um, inventing something, but then you have to have a bright mind putting these things into practice and creating new product services, ideas. From them. That makes sense. I find this very interesting because it seems to be a distinctive feature of the German science advice ecosystem that industry, business, so the, the commercial sector is much more closely linked with the academic science world and therefore involved in science advice um, than is common in other countries. And here in particular, it seems like it is not a, a pure scientific advice mechanism per se, but more like as the name suggests, I suppose, a genuine three-way dialogue between politics and research and the private sector. Exactly. So the basic idea is to have a real dialogue. So it's about an exchange of ideas and an exchange of point of views. So it's not about just uh, some researchers or CEOs giving presentations to the government and then they're done, but basically to create a a space where they can exchange ideas, where they can speak openly. So that's why it's a confidential uh, setting too. Because then, of course, all the people uh, can talk freely without it affecting um, their companies uh, the next day or um, creating a a huge commotion, but more to open up a space to share ideas, to develop something. So I have a a couple of questions following from that. Firstly, in the way you've just described it, I, I can understand the role of government and the role of industry in this dialogue. What's the role exactly of the science advisors or the scientists? So, well, it depends on the topic uh, at hand we're preparing, but of course, uh, the basic goal is always to present a view, so what's the current state of art within research, 
what's uh, the climate within business in this area of innovation and then of course what could the government do to facilitate uh, innovation in the sector so the basic idea is always to say like if the government wants uh, to push uh, ahead in this sector that's what the government could do so basically that's the advice we want to give but on of course it's uh, the decision of the government to actually uh, take action and of course then it's not just a question of innovation policy but then they have to uh, weigh it with other um, points of consideration like social policy or uh, economic policy in general. Basically, we just want to open up venues of action and then it's uh, the government's part to act on it or not, depending on what they decide. Mm. This looks to me, from the outside at least, like a kind of um, a hybrid system, which is both a standing forum for a conversation between industry and academia and the government, but also a kind of advisory body where politicians can ask questions about innovations and get expert responses. Are there other countries you know of which use a similar system or is this unique to Germany? Well, um, close talks between uh, science, um, academia, business and the government. I think that's common in quite a lot of countries. I think what's closest to the innovation dialogue might be the National Innovation Council in Sweden, which has a kind of similar setting. Uh, it meets more frequently uh, than the innovation dialogue. And I think it's closer to uh, actual implementation of specific actions. Uh, then the innovation dialogue, which is more like a high level and abstract um, awareness building on topics. But I think these are quite similar uh, structures. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the topics that the dialogue covers. What are they? And also, where do they come from? Who decides which questions you answer or which areas you work on? Yeah, sure. So to your first question, so we basically have two different kinds of topic. One uh, kind of topic is more focused on specific technologies. So we talked about man-machine interaction a few years ago. Uh, then we had a uh, discussion on biotechnology in all different areas like medicine, agriculture and industry. And uh, quite recently, we had an uh, innovation dialogue on quantum technologies of the second generations. Um, and on the other hand, we have more cross-cutting issues, um, topics like European innovation policy or general questions of knowledge uh, and technology transfer. Or uh, currently, we're talking about uh, or preparing the topic of resilience of supply chains and uh, value creation. So these are the two main types of topics we have. Uh, as to your second question, how the topics are chosen, so they're chosen by the Chancellor herself. So Angela Merkel at the end of every session then decides on the topic for the next session. Uh, and of course, uh, she can um, suggest something no one has thought about. So for example, man-machine interaction was quite a surprise to us. In other cases, uh, there are quite a few uh, suggestions for uh, possible topics already uh, in the air and uh, then one of them is chosen. So there's no no clear um, structured decision making process, but in the end, it's her um, advisory board and her choice. Yeah, interesting. So the obvious strength of that model, I suppose, is that you absolutely guarantee that the topics you work on, the advice you give, are of interest and use to the chancellor because she's the one who asked for them. Exactly. And of course, uh, because it's only chosen uh, six months before the session itself, then we can react quite flexible to new developments, uh, for example, uh, Corona um, or other um, issues that are now brought up during uh, the legislative period. So we're not set uh, with a working program for a whole four years, but work from half year to half year. I see. Is six months long enough? I mean, I, some of these topics sound like you could go into quite a lot of depth, especially with the kind of cutting edge hard sciencey ones like things like quantum computing well let me say sometimes more time would be nice uh, but <laughs> I, on the other hand i wouldn't say say that having two years would make our uh, policy paper much better so i think a few months more would be really nice uh, for us uh, at the office uh, but all in all, it's enough time. So, but of course, we're not the experts on the topics at hand, but we uh, conduct quite a lot of expert interviews um, to gather the uh, knowledge necessary and then condense it into this paper. And that works quite well. But I think one of the downsides of the, the short time we have to prepare is that, of course, uh, we can't do huge um, interview series outside of Europe, for example, because identifying um, experts abroad and then creating the contact and organizing the interviews then, that takes normally too much time to fit into the time frame uh, we have of six months. 
Yeah, well, I know that feeling very well. In Sapea, we work on a similar model, um, taking experts from all over Europe. And yeah, six to nine months is a very tight timescale often. So you started to talk about this, but could you outline the process of putting together one of your reports? Starting from the moment Chancellor Merkel asks the question, what happens next? So basically, we have the new topic on the day uh, after the innovation dialogue, and then we uh, run off. Of course, we start off with uh, desk research to get a basic idea of the topic. Uh, most of the time, if it's a topic that's not a complete surprise, we've already done uh, some uh, research into it. And quite shortly after the innovation dialogue, we have a meeting with our so-called expert circle, which is a group of experts from different organizations, research organizations and business. Um, who then give us input into that topic too from their point of view and that serves as, as a broad basis uh, to start our inquiry. So quite quickly then we start uh, to um, contact the first experts for interviews and then basically it, uh, until the next uh, innovation dialogue it's an iteration of uh, different uh, versions uh, of our paper which then uh, is put forward to the experts uh, for further input. So in the end, we have three iterations until we have a final product. And of, co of course, in every iteration, we conduct additional interviews, do additional desk research, uh, and then of course, try to um, sharpen uh, or focus the topic. Uh, so in the end, we have a concise um, paper. Okay, and what happens to that paper? So we uh, prepared uh, this report, we call it Dossier, um, which then consists of um, everything we've ga gathered within the interviews we've conducted and compiled into uh, a coincise precis form. Uh, we always aim for 30 to 50 pages. Most of the time it's a bit longer than that. And then it's sent off uh, to the government and to uh, the steering committee and forms the basis for um, the session of the innovation dialogue itself. And that steering committee, I guess, is the people who will end up taking part in the actual dialogue with Chancellor Merkel. So the steering committee has been appointed by the Chancellery. And when you look at it, it's a representation of all the relevant groups from the German innovation system. So basically, you have the presidents from Max Planck and Fraunhofer, for example, representing fundamental research and applied research. And on the business side, you have a mix of small and large um, companies. Uh, so the large companies represented by the CEOs, for example, are BMW, BASF, and Infineon, while on the SME side, you have uh, companies from the areas of mechanical engineering, biotech, meditech, and microresists. One additional noteworthy member is the chairman of the German Trade Union Confederation. So the unions are represented within the Innovation Dialogue too. Yeah. Okay. Well, now, at the risk of sounding extremely geeky, <laughs> I know uh, quite a lot of our listeners are interested in the nitty gritty of how things like this work. So I'm going to ask some quite in-depth questions. The first one that comes to mind is whether there's any interaction during the process of preparing an innovation dialogue between you yourselves and the chancellor's office or the government. So do you go back and forth on scoping or anything like that? Or is it all done completely independently? No, we are in close contact with uh, the chancellery and the uh, ministries that are involved in the innovation dialogue to, of course, hear their point of view and then, of course, uh, talk to them about what um, specific information would be of interest uh, to them. So we uh, can then, within our other interviews, um, gather information on this to present uh, information that, of course, is usable. So, of course, they are not telling us what to write or anything. But of course, it's interesting and good to know what they are interested in. So we uh, then can, uh, can tailor our um, text, our document, our recommendations uh, to the specific needs. But of course, if there is something within the interviews uh, where the interview partners say this is a complete blind spot to the government, then of course, we uh, try to put that into a spotlight. So it's, an, it's a good exchange uh, and they're um, involved in uh, the different iteration of the text too. But of course, um, basically, our advice is independent from the government. But what we present in the end is our document, not uh, something that has to be green lit uh, by the government. Yeah, that's good to know. I suppose that's a basic requirement for any mechanism like this, that, that you're able to say to Chancellor Merkel or whoever what you think needs saying without needing approval in advance. I mean, otherwise, the advice you give isn't really of much use to the policymaker anyway. Exactly. But the reason I bring this up is that there's a live debate in science advice, as I'm sure you're familiar with, about the tension between 
um, on the one hand, the need to make sure that the science advice is on target and can be agile and fit to what the policymakers need, and also that they feel like they're invested and so on. And on the other hand, the need to make sure that it's free of political influence and independent and that experts are able to follow the evidence rather than the inclinations of politicians. And different mechanisms deal with that tension in different ways, I think. So sometimes a mechanism will have a very clear firebreak, as it were, between the researchers who produce the evidence and the policymakers who use it. And other times you have a setup which deliberately brings all those people into the same room all the time so as to like maximize relevance and buy-in. And it seems to me like the innovation dialogue leans very strongly in that latter direction, not just with the close collaboration of policymakers, or in this case, I suppose, one single policymaker, but also in the close involvement of industry. How do you feel about that? Are there any kind of mechanisms in place to make sure that um, despite the level of interaction, your experts can still feel independent? Well, I think the most important part about keeping it neutral or to to paint a full picture and not a very particular picture from one perspective is the interviews we're doing. So we are conducting 80 to 90 interviews. So in the end, uh, we've made sure that at least within Germany, we've talked to all the major players um, um, when it comes to a specific topic, and we present that within our uh, policy paper. So our steering committee, um, of course, has input into this paper. Um, and then, of course, the uh, recommendations given are discussed with the steering committee because they are, of course, the advisors to the government. Uh, but the paper itself tries to uh, paint the full picture. Um, and if there are min minority positions which are uh, relevant, then we present uh, them too. So, of course, uh, then you have um, particular directions within um, the paper that the people want to present. But we try to um, give a balanced view. And that's, of course, why uh, the preparation of the innovation dialogue by, by our office is so important, because, of course, we talked about different topics like quantum technologies, uh, resilience, uh, biotech, and so on. So that means within our uh, steering committee, not every person is an expert on that very specific topic. So, of course, they rely on us to uh, present uh, a broad outline, and then they can use this as a, a springboard for their own contributions within uh, the dialogue. And of course, what has to be said that the innovation dialogue is an advisory board, so there are no decisions made within uh, the innovation dialogue, of course. So the government is completely free to do uh, what it wants with um, the advice, but there is no mechanism uh, requiring then immediate political actions in one way or the other. All right. So how about that, that government action? Have you seen any evidence of the impact of your advice, like new policies being put in place, or I guess the government changing its mind about things? Or, or failing that, what are your general impressions about the usefulness of the advice you give? Well, it's always uh, a bit difficult to say, um, to trace something back directly to the innovation dialogue, because, of course, there are so many under, uh, other advisory boards and um, NGOs and other groups that are putting forth uh, advice to the government, too, which often is quite similar to what we suggest. So it's quite hard to say that this is only the, the innovation dialogue and not uh, something else. But I think what we definitely can point towards is, um, on one hand, when it comes to the artificial intelligence strategy of the government. So as I mentioned, we had this innovation dialogue on man-machine interaction uh, a few years ago. And following that, within the high-tech forum, uh, another advisory board of the federal government, there was a, a sub-forum dedicated to autonomous systems which um, was fed by uh, the discussion within the uh, innovation dialogue. And then this, uh, in turn, was used to create the artificial intelligence strategy for Germany. So we can see that there's a clear line of discussions running from the innovation dialogue uh, up to the strategy. And of course, others contributed to that strategy too. I don't want to deny that. But we have a clear line. And the other big thing is uh, that there's a new agency within Germany called Agentur für Sprung Innovation basically an agency uh, for disruptive innovation within Germany, which was an idea discussed uh, in an innovation dialogue and then um, created over the last few years. And it started uh, its operations now this year. And the first few projects now have been chosen. I think this is uh, a really good example of our impact because um, the problems of Germany and the whole of Europe in general, when it comes to disruptive innovation compared to incremental innovation, was a topic that came up within different uh, innovation dialogues again and again. And then there was 
uh, talks. So how can we address this? How can we become more agile in this regard? Um, and then the idea of this agency was put forth uh, to address this issue as a specific mechanism um, of support. Do you make concrete policy recommendations? Like, do you advocate for particular changes on the basis of the evidence or like identify problems as you see them? Or do you just kind of present the evidence? How does it work now? Well, we lay out the evidence, we provide options. And then, of course, within those options, we give a broad strokes for policy action that could be taken. So because it's a quite high level um, advisory board, it's not like we're not talking about individual paragraphs within specific laws or whatever. But it's more um, highlighting this is an area where some um, issues are present that have to be addressed or huge windows of opportunity. And if the government would like to uh, take action, then that might be a, an interesting direction uh, to take. So it's uh, specific policy recommendations, but it's not like we already written uh, proposals for specific funding programs or laws or whatever. And of course, it depends a little bit uh, on, on the topic. As, as I talked before, we have more uh, technology-oriented topics. Uh, they are more focused on um, making visible what's happening within science, happening within innovation in these areas. And then on the other hand, those cross-cutting issues like European innovation policy or technology transfer, of course, these are topics where you have uh, decades of political debate on them already. So it's not like uh, the government learns anything new about the topic at hand uh, per se. But then, of course, it's about uh, presenting us uh, a picture of the current mood within academia and business on this topic at hand and highlighting um, opportunities or issues that need to be addressed. Right. Yeah, I understand. And for those kinds of topics, then, it seems like a dialogue is uh, potentially a really powerful tool for policymakers. I mean, to be able to put your finger on the pulse of exactly what researchers are thinking about and interested in right now, or indeed the private sector, like you said, what their general mood is on a particular topic, even if that topic is not a particularly new one, if it's a perennial topic of debate. Um, that's something I think many governments could really appreciate. And I think with a lot of science advice systems, they don't really work that way. They tend to be more about presenting the latest or the best uh, scientific evidence in response to a very specific identified policy need or question, which is a slightly different proposition from just uh, testing the water. Yeah, I think it's a good opportunity for the chancellor and for the ministers uh, to hear first-hand experience, so not filtered. And of course, that enables them then to ask questions within their own ministry and like, guys, shouldn't we do this or how about this? So, of course, the innovation dialogue uh, creates an impulse uh, for action within the ministries and within government too. And on the other hand, it kind of serves as a mirror too, so the government can see uh, how... Um, its own actions are reflected within the opinion um, of the experts in business uh, and academia. Because, of course, within quite a lot of the topics, for example, talking about biotech, uh, you have funding schemes, uh, you have um, innovation policy programs on that very topic. And then, of course, it's interesting to hear from the people within the companies and uh, within uh, academia how they perceive uh, these actions and what they think is good and what they think should be done on top. Do you see any potential conflicts with this setup, though? I mean, so, for instance, when you have a more kind of pure science advice setup, uh, such as like the one I'm involved with at a European level, the scientific advice mechanism, we're always very careful to steer clear of giving advice on so-called policy for science issues. We're very aware that the experts who are being consulted can also be the people whose interests are potentially at least directly affected by changes, so change the public funding in, in those precise areas that they're being consulted on, right? So for that reason, we never take a specific position on EU research funding policy, for instance, or certainly not to the extent of saying you should give more money to my area or whatever, um, because of the obvious potential for a conflict of interests, or, or at least the appearance of that kind of conflict, if you're looking from the outside, you don't want to have scientists trying to wear both hats at once, like the advocacy hat and the expert advisor hat. And it seems like with the, with the innovation dialogue, you face that challenge too, but kind of twice over, because it's not just scientists. I guess you might argue that scientists are more able to separate the two things because of their commitment to uh, what you might contentiously call scientific values. It's also industry, 
which works with a quite different set of end goals and purposes in mind. How do you navigate that challenge of independence or or lack of it? How do you minimize the conflict? And even if you do it successfully, how do you avoid the appearance of conflict to people looking in from the outside? Well, gee, first question I would say, um, short answer would be like, uh, we try to be neutral. The longer answer is uh, that I, I think the strength of the innovation dialogue is that it makes visible the different perspectives um, of the three groups uh, present within uh, the innovation dialogues. So of course, no one expects uh, uh, the business side to argue for uh, the science side or the science side to take the position of the political side, but it's basically uh, to create a space where the different logics and the different perspectives can can meet and exchange their views and ideas. And I think with quite a lot of uh, topics, I think the real benefit of the innovation dialogue is to hear about how um, is this an opportunity or an issue uh, for academia or for business and for the other side to hear this because of course uh, a businessman or, or a businesswoman is in their own um, world trapped well not trapped but uh, mostly used to thinking within their own logic and then if they hear that for example when it comes to knowledge transfer the issue for scientists is not like funding but that transfer activities are not attractive when it comes to a um, scientific career then I think this is an eye-opener to give them more of an insight why some types of collaborations are harder to initiate than they might think. It's more like um, highlighting the um, radical difference between the different uh, perspectives. And I think that's the very productive element of the innovation dialogue. Yeah, I see. So the approach is more to lay everything out very clearly so you can see what everyone is saying and try to neutralize it that way rather than try and protect it from undue influence. Exactly. So within our papers, uh, um, the interview partners, uh, we use Chatham House rules. So within the document, you can't see who said what. But of course, we highlight uh, different opinions or different uh, views uh, to show the, the whole range uh, of views on a topic. And of course, then we say, well, that's more of a major majority opinion. That's more of a min minority opinion. But we try to highlight uh, where uh, the conflicts are, because then, of course, that's the idea for the innovation dialogue to um, give a structured basis for discussion uh, to, and give a structured um, overview of points that are um, not clear yet, but part of contentious debates. And then, of course, that's uh, up to the members of the Innovation Dialogue and within the session itsel itself to take uh, positions on one side or the other if they want to. Yeah, and I can start to understand now why this approach is particularly viable when you're talking specifically about innovation, where the conversations will often be I guess, around the bleeding edge and therefore there's likely to be a lot more uncertainty and dispute compared to areas where the science is more settled. Exactly. Mm. So this has been really interesting. Thank you for introducing me and, and our audience to this intriguing setup. I have one more question for you. Let's see if you're willing to be drawn on it. So, <laughs> so Germany has federal elections next year. And as I understand it, the chancellor will change no matter what. We, we know that much. Um, of course, nobody can predict the future in politics, but if the innovation dialogue was Mrs. Merkel's idea in the first place, do you think it's here to stay? Well, as you said, um, the, the chancellor will change as far as we know. And uh, the innovation dialogue is the personal advisory board for Chancellor Merkel and innovation policy. So, of course, we hope that the next uh, chancellor will uh, have a similar need or interest in uh, science and innovation policy advice. Uh, and. Of course, then we hope that there will be a, a similar format to the innovation dialogue. But I think, uh, of course, um, it will have to change a little bit because every new chancellor will have uh, the need for their own uh, um, advisory board tailored to their specific needs. And of course, we're blessed with a chancellor who's very interested in technology and science at the moment. And we hope that this interest will continue uh, with the next chancellor. And of course, Akatech itself was created to um, focus the um, policy advice from um, engineering and applied sciences uh, towards uh, the public and towards the government. So of course, Akatech uh, will hopefully play a role in um, science and policy advice uh, for the next government too, sure. Well, I look forward to hearing how things turn out. Florian, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much, Toby. The Science for Policy podcast is produced by SAPEA. We're a consortium of Europe's academies and learning societies, and we're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism. We provide evidence and expertise to inform the work of the group of chief scientific advisors. 
Sapea is funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 program for research and innovation, and you can find lots more information about us and our work at sapea.info. Finally, the rather lovely cello music that's playing right now is performed by Elizaveta Sushchenko, so I shall shut up and let you enjoy the last few bars. Bye for now.